Hello, and welcome to my channel, Reading Little Blue Books Out Loud. This is a little blue book. It just happens to be little blue book number 834, and it is, in, it is titled The Younger Generation and Its Attitude Toward Life, written by Ralph Oppenheimer. Now, a little explanation. This is copyrighted in 1927. So, the generation this book is speaking of is dead. Or over 100 right now. Because this generation that he's speaking of was born in the 1900s. 1900 to 1910. Because this would be the generation that is a young adult or a teenager. Okay, so, let's learn how uh, the attitudes of the younger generation of the 1920s was up to forward so much has been written of the younger generation that there scarcely seems room for further discussion the sub subject has been dealt with by everyone who has something to say and lots who haven't we find in our novels our plays our movies our magazines and newspapers ministers have preached about it teachers have taught about it psychologists have analyzed it sentimentalists have told us how good it really is what is left to say we know all about the corruption of modern youth how the evils of jazz gin and sex the unholy three are leading the youngsters to perdition we know that there have never been so many criminals and first-class criminals at that among our boys and girls we know that they are more or less a godless bunch that they do not honor their fathers and mothers that they are burning themselves out in an endless orgy of sensual pleasures instead of equipping themselves for the tasks of propagating the race and making way for a better civilization but why go on this is all old stuff it has been drummed into us to such an extent that even the most omnivorous reader are failing, falling prey to indigestion. I am going to relate a little story. A boy, aged 18, had a terrific row with his old-fashioned father. The father, blazing mad, burst into a furious denunciation, denunciation of the younger generation, what the world was coming to, etc., he concluded by saying, Usually a father thinks a lot of his son, admires him. But do you know what I think of you? The son flared up. Do you know what I think of you? He countered defiantly. And that's just the point I want to make. Hitherto, all the discussions concerning the younger generation have been conducted by adults, who, in one sense, are outsiders. They have had the floor for a long time and have done all the shooting. But what are the object of their controversy, the boys and girls themselves? What do they think of the situation? What are their views, their aims, their attitude toward life? The purpose of this little blue book is to answer just these questions. In other words, to offer a study of the younger generation by one of its own members. Before starting, perhaps it would be well to give my credentials. I am 19 years of age, born in New York City, educated in public schools, out-of-town boarding schools, and high school. It is true that in my case I have been met with understanding, so that although my problems have been similar to those which confront the American youth of today, their handling was easier. I have made numerous acquaintances among my contemporaries, not only here, but in various other parts of the country. And these associations have given me a fair conception of the situation. I am going to try my best to describe this situation with sufficient clarity and logic, to convince the reader that there is another side to the question. Chapter 1. The Revolt of Youth 
Solness, middle-aged master builder, is speaking to the young and impetuous Hilda Wangle. Solness, in a low voice, I must tell you, I haven't begun to be so afraid, so terribly afraid of the younger generation. Hilda, pooh, is that younger generation a thing to be afraid of? It is indeed, and that is why I have locked and barred myself in. I tell you, the younger generation will one day come and thunder at my door. They will break in upon me. Then I should say, ought, then I should say, you ought to go out and open the door to the younger generation. Open the door. Yes. Let them come in to you on friendly terms, as it were. No, no, no. The younger generation, it means retribution, you see. It comes as if under a new banner, heralding the turn of fortune. Henrik Eisben wrote The Master Builder 35 years ago, a good time before the birth of our present younger generation. But like Wagner and Nietzsche, he saw the premature drawing of a movement which was to spread throughout the whole civilized world, a turning point in our history, resulting ultimately in a complete change. Solonist fears have come to be realized. The younger generation has thundered on his door, has broken in upon him, waving its new banner. The revolt of youth is in full swing, and it is all the more baffling, because the world has never been forced to cope with it before. The reader must not misconstrue the above as meaning that the conflict between the older and younger generation is something new and unheard of. As a matter of fact, it is, a old, is, as, it is as old as the race. The elders have always feared the young, who they know must someday replace them, shove them into the background. But what is new is the attitude of youth itself. Hitherto, youth has been willing to accept the traditions of the elders, to look upon them with certain respect, and to hide its time. Oh, I'm sorry, to bide its time. Now the feeling seems to be that these old traditions must be smashed completely. Youth must revolt, must cast discipline and restraint to the winds, and go over to the logical extreme of reckless abandon. For this reason, the theory that the boys and girls of today are fundamentally the same as the old-fashioned boys and girls, a theory advanced by our sentimentalist, is pretty shabby. Of course, it is true of some of our boys and girls. Not all of them have been caught up in this sweeping movement by any means. But can it be applied to the vast majority? Let us try. We will grant that in the old days, the younger generation did many things as relatively shocking as the things they do today. They disobeyed their parents and defied certain rigid conventions. But it must be remembered that they did all this with a feeling of guilt. They were inwardly ashamed of their behavior, for they recognized it as sinful. It is a boy, if a boy went and got drunk, and we mean always the average boy, he did it on the sly kept it from his parents. If they found out, he would quail before them in thorough disgrace. Their reproaches would burn him because he felt he deserved them. Is this true of today? The following story, extreme in some ways, but nevertheless not uncommon, will doubtless seem incredible to some of my readers, though I will vouch for its veracity. I happened to be visiting a friend of mine, a boy of 19, who was looked upon by young and old as a fine fellow. Oh, this particular evening, he was going to a party. Before leaving, he came into the living room, where his father sat reading the newspaper. Dad, he began carefully, can you let me have some of your hooch? Father looked up in astonished chagrin. He was a tolerant man, and he knew his son. But this was a little too much. I should say not, he exploded. I'm not giving away any hooch to be swilled by you and your rowdy friends. Ah, I tell you, I'm going to a party, the son argued silently, or sullenly. You've got to have something in your flask or they won't look at me. Gee whiz, 
I never thought you were so stingy. The father waxed indignant. See here, son. You have no business to go out and get drunk like this. I'll be damned if I stand for it any longer. Listen, the boy's tone was insolent and challenging. Suppose I am going to get drunk. Does that hurt you? I am old enough to take care of myself. Gosh, he sighed. You're always begrudging me a good time. I can't work all day like this without letting go once in a while. It never bothered you. I never came home until I was sober. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Think of your mother. Mother understands it all, said the son triumphantly. She said you should give me the stuff. Well, you're not getting any hooch from me. The son cursed and snorted. All right, I'll get my own bootlegger since you're so darn miserable. Go ahead, said the father. Resignedly, then summoning all the firmness that was left in him, he added, But you won't spend a cent of my money. A few days later, I was at this house again. We sat at the table with his parents and his sister. How'd you make out at the party? I inquired. Oh, he laughed. You should have seen me. They said I was drunk as a lord. Had some of that white mule. White mule? What's that? asked his mother with mild interest. Pure alcohol, put in the father. Pure poison, if you ask me. I couldn't drink the stuff if you paid me for doing it. It sure is hot stuff, the boy conceded, though it would burn my throat out. Don't think I ever got so completely soused. They said one minute I was crying and the next I was laughing, and I went around trying to hug and kiss all the girls weeping on their shoulders. You ought to be ashamed, began the father. <coughs> Aw, what's eating you, the son burst out. It don't put you to any bother, did I? Ted let me sleep there at his house, didn't he? He turned to me. Didn't wake up until 4 p.m. next afternoon. Boy, what a hangover I had. And there you have it in a nutshell. As I said before, the real change has been one of attitude. Most boys and girls of today, far from being ashamed of their con conduct, advertise and boast about it in the presence of their own families. And the reason they do not feel guilty about it is that they no longer regard it as sinful. The boy I spoke of thought it perfectly proper to ask his father for some hooch, though it's thought it justifiable to go and get drunk. It is on this change of attitude that the present movement a revolt is based. It explains why boys and girls of the best families are indulging and drinking, smoking, and promiscuous petting. They simply can't see anything wrong about it, nor can the older people convince them that it's evil. I overheard a mother saying to a friend, I don't know what to do about my daughter. She goes out with strange fellows the worst kind and lets them kiss and pet her. I've tried to show her how sinful it is, but she doesn't seem to understand. I do not want to give the impression, however, that all the young people of today have this attitude. As has been mentioned, not all of them have been caught in the big movement. One can find a vast number of boys and girls who are living quiet, conventional lives, who respect their parents and adhere strongly to the old traditions. Likewise, there is that class of serious-minded youth, the potential artists and thinkers, a surprisingly large number, as I will attempt to show later, who feel that jazz, drink, and sex are superficial pleasures, appealing only to the physical side and not to the intellectual. These are not to be confused with the old-fashioned children. The former are good because of their morals, because they regard the wild life as evil. The latter, because the life has no attraction for them, because they prefer staying quietly at home to going around with the gang. Of course, many boys and girls with the old-fashioned point of view are having a good time, on the sly, keeping it from their parents because they recognize it as wrong. On the other hand, we find just as many who, though they have the new attitude and believe in absolute freedom, don't go in for the fast life at all. And those who do go in for it don't necessarily go to the extremes. 
Some are moderate in everything. Some draw the line on drink, others on sex, and so on. But taken by the large, the condition I have described is widespread enough to constitute a movement, and it is on the movement itself that we must focus our attention. We have seen that the revolt is based on a new attitude of youth. What then are the underlying causes of this attitude? Exponents of the younger generation have offered various explanations. One woman writer says the reason for it is that the children have been spoiled. A quarter of a century ago, she explains, a group of educators advanced the theory that rigid discipline handicapped a child's natural development. This theory was misinterpreted by parents and teachers who thought it meant that they could that they must do away with discipline entirely. Consequently, we have the first generation brought up under no restraint. They have been given the free reign, and they don't know how to use it. Besides, they have no sense of true values for their parents, have turned over to them all the soft comforts of the machine age, limousines, electricity, radio, and movies, etc. While this argument sounds plausible enough, I don't think it would stand up under close scrutiny. First of all, have these children been brought up under no restraints? Such theories about discipline have been advanced all through the ages, and there was always a small percentage of people to take them seriously. But it seems to me that parents, generally speaking, are pretty much the same as ever. Some of them more lax, some of them very rigid in their disciplines. For the majority of them to cast aside all correctives, whether mild or severe, would be contrary to the law of nature, which makes parents parents. No, the fault hardly lies with them. The revolt of their children came in spite of them, not through them. As the second point, it is doubtless true that the machine age has had a great deal to do with the revolt, but not in the superficial way this woman suggests. She seems to forget that very many children were not brought up in such soft surroundings, not given such luxuries. The poor still live in crowded, badly ventilated tenements, with gas lighting and little heat. They have no limousines, though it must be admitted that most of them manage to afford radio and movies. Well, there are several other theories. Some writers hold that jazz and the movies have corrupted modern youth, the one by its obvious sensual suggestiveness, the other by the loose life it often depicts. The remedy in this case would be to abolish jazz and purify the pictures. But are these genuine causes? How did the movies and jazz become what they are? Wouldn't it sound more plausible to call them an outgrowth rather than a cause of the present movement? In short, it would seem that the true answer has a deeper and more complicated source. That one, that one can't lay down any particular dogma. Let us go back to the early part of this century, when the younger generation came into the world, and let us trace over the years from that time to the present. Perhaps then we shall be able to find some clues. And I think I will stop there. That is the end of chapter one. And uh, I will return in part two for the beginning of chapter two. Thanks for listening.